Good morning, I'm Mike Bloom of Breath of Life Christian Teaching Center, and this morning we're going to do something a little different. We've done this a couple times before, but I want to take you back to 2016 when I ministered a message entitled, From the Perspective of the Cleft. And Moses was wanting to see the glory of God, and God showed him, there is a place that you can see my glory. Just like a message to us that there is something that will allow us to see the glory of God in a greater way. And Moses was to stand in what God referred to as a cleft in the rock, a place of breaking. Breaking in the rock. And that represents the cross of Jesus Christ. So I want to share that with you this morning. Little did Moses realize that he was involved in a foreshadow of the greatest glory of God, the means of seeing the greatest form of God's glory imaginable, that could only be through the work of the cross. And he just experienced somewhat of a preview of that, a shadow. And we've got the real thing. And so let's get into some worship right now and get our hearts ready as we get into this message. And I pray that it blesses you as much as it blessed me to receive a revelation like this from God's Word. Wonderful, he is mighty, he is the Lord of my life. Marvelous, he is matchless, he is king of divine. He is wonderful, he is mighty, he is the Lord of my life. The problems you seem to face disappear when you stop and sing. He is wonderful, he is mighty, he is the Lord of my life. Marvelous, he is matchless, he is king of divine. I'll return No, I won't leave you time for our offering, and if you'd like to give to our ministry and this is a blessing to you, you can do so by e-transfer or PayPal at bolm.portage at gmail.com or paypal.me slash breathoflifechurch. We really appreciate your giving, and it goes toward the work of this ministry. Thanks and God bless. 
power against all the power of the enemy. In him, we're more than conquerors. Without him, we can do nothing. Never forget that. But in him, amen. You're over all principalities and powers. You're seated with him in heavenly places. And, and this goes right along with what we want to minister about. Everybody say the cleft. And I have a message I want to speak to from the perspective of the cleft. And I had uh, touched on these scriptures before. I don't know if, I don't think I have here, maybe a bit, but um, God was speaking to me more about it. And how many know it's like there's layers of that Bible? <laughs> like you can go deeper and deeper and deeper. You can stay shallow if you want to, but there's a depth there. Paul talked to the Corinthians. He said, the deep things of God, eye hasn't seen, ear hasn't heard. But there's searching out the deep things of God. And, and how many want to go deeper with Him? Amen. Amen. Sink your roots in so deep to Him. Praise God that the enemy can't pull you out. And so I'm going to go to Exodus chapter 32 with Moses and Israel in the wilderness, beginning at the first verse. And when the people saw that Moses delayed to come down out of the mount, the people gathered themselves together unto Aaron and said un unto him, Up, make us gods, which shall go before us. And it's almost like they've got some disdain for Moses. As for this Moses, the man that brought us up out of the land of Egypt, we wot not what's become of him. And Aaron said unto them, Break off the golden earrings that are in your ears of your wives, your sons, your daughters. Bring them to me. And all the people break off the golden earrings which were in their ears, brought them to Aaron. He received them at their hand and fashioned it with a graving tool after he made it a molten calf. And they said, These be thy gods, Israel, which brought thee up out of the land of Egypt. Then down in verse 7, And the Lord said unto Moses, Go get thee down, for the people which thou broughtest out of the land of Egypt have corrupted themselves. Moses is on the mountain. How many remember what the first commandment was? There's one God. Worship Him only. No other God shall you serve. Worship Him your heart, your might, your power. The people broke the first one before Moses had a chance to even give them the tables of law. And God says, get down there. They've turned aside quickly out of the way which I commanded them. So quickly, they just came out of Egypt. God had just given them the Ten Commandments. Didn't even have a chance to let them read it. And that quickly, they turned aside out of the way that God commanded. And they have made them a molten calf and have worshipped it and sacrificed thereunto and said, These be thy gods, O Israel, which brought thee up out of the land of Egypt. And the Lord said unto Moses, Now watch this. Moses is going to go through a little test here. And actually, there's a, God spoke to me about that, and I, I just don't feel to talk about that issue. But this was a test for Moses, and we'll get into that another day. But watch what God says to him. I've seen this people, and behold, it's a stiff-necked people. Now, therefore, let me alone. Can you hear his anger? That my wrath may wa wax hot against them, that I may consume them, and I will make of thee a great nation. God was actually telling Moses, you're going to be another Abraham now. I'm going to wipe and annihilate these people and you're going to be a person from whom a nation's going to serve me. Now how many know that could be very tempting to have God tell you, you want to be another Abraham? I'll get rid of all these guys and I'll make a great nation out of you. Some say God was testing Moses. God was testing him. Would God, would, would Moses be more concerned about the people? Would he be more concerned with what people thought of God? Or would he be more concerned with himself? And say, I'm, hey, hey, wife, I'm going to be another Abraham. So yes, he was going through a test. He would be the next Abraham. God had done so much. He had done so many miracles with Israel. They saw it with their own eyes. They saw Pharaoh's whole kingdom bow down to the God of heaven. And they still... We're going in toward idolatry. And, and it's like a, God spoke to Moses. He was testing him. But Moses took advantage of that. Not in a bad way. In a good way. Amen. In a way I think God wants all of us to go after God even more. And, and so as a result of all this. 
I want to show you something about the work of the cross in the middle of it all. How many know Jesus is in the book of Genesis? Jesus is in the book of Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy, Joshua, Judges. He's through every book of the Bible. You'll see Jesus. You'll see the work of the cross and you'll see the blood somehow. And Moses said something in chapter 32, verse 11 to 14, that he really wanted to know God more and more. How many feel like Moses? I want to know him more. I want to know. You ever hear that hymn that we sing sometimes? I want to know you, Lord. I want to know you so much. Praise God. And in chapter 32 and 11, Moses besought the Lord his God and said, Lord, why does their wrath wax hot against your people? You brought them out of the land of Egypt with great power, with a mighty hand. Wherefore should the Egyptians, why are you giving the Egyptians a chance to say, for mischief did he bring them out? He just brought them out to destroy them. What kind of God is that? You see, Moses was tempted. I could be another Abraham here. God could wipe these people out. But Moses' heart was so meek and he was so selfless that he was concerned what God would look like in the eyes of the Egyptians if God made him the next Abraham and wiped out all those other people. How many know you got to be pretty humble and meek to, to pray in a situation like that the way Moses prayed? Please, Lord, turn your fierce anger away. Repent of this evil against the people. Remember Abraham. In other words, I don't want to be another Abraham. Uh, it's not about me, Lord. And I think he probably never realized God was testing. How I many know it wasn't God's will to do that? He was testing Moses, though. He wanted a man of God that would be so selfless. Hallelujah. Remember Moses said, God's going to raise up a prophet like unto me. Unto you, him shall the people listen and hearken. And Jesus Christ said, follow me, I am meek and lowly. And Moses was meek. And Moses was just a shadow of what Jesus would be though. But nevertheless, Moses had that meekness. He said, remember Abraham, Isaac, and Israel, your servants, to whom you swear by your own self. And you said to them, I will multiply your seed as the stars of heaven. All this land that I've spoken of will I give to your seed. They should have it forever. And the Lord repented of the evil which he thought to do unto his people. And if you go to chapter 32, verse 30, it came to pass on the morrow that Moses said to the people, you have sinned a great sin. And now I will go unto the Lord. Peradventure, I shall make an atonement for your sin. How many know Jesus is our atonement? Here's where you start to see a shadow of Jesus. Here's where you start to see. How many have known that we've all been stiff-necked and rebellious at one time or other? Amen. How many admit it? We've all had those times, and especially before we knew the Lord. I mean, but there was an atonement. And Moses returned unto the Lord and said, Oh, this people have sinned a great sin. They have made them gods of gold. Yet now, if thou wilt forgive their sin, and if not, blot me, I pray thee, out of your book. Take me out too. If they're not going, I'm not going. No, they're not innocent. I believe and I agree with you, but I don't want you to look bad and I don't want to see them destroyed. So take my name out of the book of life if you're going to do it with them. Wow, what a man of God. And the Lord said unto Moses, whosoever has sinned against me, him will I blot out of my book. And there's where the, if you keep reading the plague hit. But notice Moses said, I'll get atonement for you. Because Romans 5 and 11 says, Jesus Christ is how we've received the atonement. Somebody say, Jesus is my atonement. And I like, uh, you always hear me say this, and you probably know it. At tone is made up of two words, at one. Jesus is my at one -ment. I'm at one with God now because of Jesus. Me and God were separated once because of sin. But God dealt with that sin and that is taken out of the way. And if it separated me from God and it's gone now, I'm at one with God again. How many are glad for the atonement? Yeah. Jesus Christ is our atonement. Hallelujah. And back to chapter 33 now, the next chapter in Exodus. And the Lord said unto Moses, Depart, go up hence, you and your people, which I brought out of the land of Egypt, unto the land which I swear. But look in verse 2. I'm going to send an angel. In other words, okay, I won't destroy them. And you know what? I think God was testing Moses again. I'll send an angel. I'm not going. They're too unholy. I won't destroy them. I accept what you had said. 
But I'm going to send an angel and let him lead them because I refuse to be amongst that unholy people. I, and, and I will drive out the Canaanite. I'll drive out the Amorite, the Hittite, Perizzite, Hivite, and Jebusites. But I'm not leading them. An angel will lead them. And so verse 12 says, Moses said unto the Lord, See thou sayest unto me, bring up this people. God, you told me to bring them up. And thou hast not let me know whom thou wilt send with me. I don't know this angel. I don't even want to know this angel. It might be fascinating to the natural mind to have all these angels come down and, all, and some angel, Michael, whoever it might be, lead us. But I'm not interested in that. You said, I know you by name, Moses. And you also, I found grace in your sight. Now, therefore, I pray thee, if I found grace in your sight, show me now thy way that I may know thee. I want to know you, God. I don't want to know any angel. Thank you, Lord, for the angels. Thank you for the ministering spirits sent to the heirs of salvation. But I want to see you, and I want to know you. My heart's out for you alone, God. And this is where Moses was taking advantage of this thing. I'm going to draw closer to God through all of this. How many would like to draw closer to God through all the struggles you go through, all the problems you go through? If you don't realize it, realize it this morning. You draw closer to God when you come out the other side of a trial, amen, doing the right thing. Praise God, Satan's going to wish he never touched you. He's going to wish he never messed you up because you held on to God when you went through the battle and you ended up getting closer to God than you ever were before. Somebody praise him right now. Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. And he says, I want to know you, God, that I might find grace in thy sight and consider that this nation is thy people. And he said, my presence will go with thee. That got a hold of God so much, I will give thee rest. I will personally lead them. And you know, Moses doesn't stop. He wants to make sure. Boy, I tell you, Moses, he wants to get everything from God that he can. When God sees you like that, I think of Jacob and Esau. Je Esau had the first right blessing from God. And he, he just disregarded it for a bowl of soup, porridge. And Jacob says, I want that firstborn blessing. He said, I'll give it, I'll, I'll give you my porridge, Esau, if you give me that firstborn. He wanted the things of God, while Esau wanted the things of the world. Worried about his own belly. Folks, when God sees you like Job, I esteem the words of his mouth more than my necessary food. Uh, he'll bless, he'll bless, and draw you so close to him. Somebody say, I want that kind of heart. Yeah. And so, Exodus thirty-three fifteen. 15, he said unto him, Moses is going to make a deal with God. If thy presence go not with me, now remember, God said, I'll go with you. But Moses wants to make sure. He heard God, but he's taking advantage of this. If you say you're going to go with me, if you're not, carry us not up hence. For wherein shall it be known here that I and thy people have found grace in your sight? It's like God never even said anything. He says, God, I want you to take us because what are people going to think if you don't? Is it not that thou goest with us? So, so shall we be separated, I and thy people, from all the people around the face of the earth. If you go with us, people will all know that we are the people of God. And people will all know that you're a good God and you're a merciful God. We'll be able to tell them about how they were so sinful. But you forgave them, God. But I really want to make sure you're going with us. And the Lord said unto Moses, I will do this thing also that thou hast spoken, for you found grace in my sight. And I know you by name. And he said, I beseech thee, Moses is saying, show me thy glory. <laughs> oh my. Show me your glory. In other words, I want to know you're going to be with us. Now, if you're going to be with us, it shouldn't be a big request for me to ask to see your glory, just to know you're here, just to know this is going to happen. And I'm telling you, God's heart must have been busting so much for Moses' hunger and desire for him. And he said, I will make all my goodness pass before thee. I'll proclaim the name of the Lord before you. I'll be gracious to whom I'll be gracious. I'll show mercy on whom I'll show mercy. And he said, but you can't see my face. For there shall no man see and live. And the Lord said, behold, here's how we're going to do it. There's a place by me. 
How many want to find whatever place is closest to him and get in it? There's a place right close to me. I want to get in that kind of a place where I'm so close to God. And you'll stand on a rock when you're in that place. How many know he's building his church on the rock? And though if, if there's a place close to him and it's on a rock and Jesus says, I'll build my church on the rock, you get in the church, you're close to God. And it shall come to pass while my glory passes by that I will put thee in a cliff of the rock. Or cleft. And I was on the way to service this morning and it crossed my mind. I said to Iris, I said, you know, I was just wondering, a cleft, how many know, what, you ever, anyone ever cleave wood here? What are you doing when you cleave wood? You're splitting it, right? And, and a cleft on the rock is somewhere where the rock has been struck and split open. There's a cleft there. A cleavage in the rock. And, and this is where Moses would stand. And it just struck my heart. And I said to my wife, I'm, I wonder, how many remember Moses struck a rock before this? He struck the rock or, and, and water flowed out. And I thought to myself, is that the place where Moses actually struck the rock? And God told him he wanted him to stand there where the rock was struck. And so I got my electronic Bible in my tablet here and I found, and one of the commentators said, that was the place where Moses struck the rock with his rod. Ooh, I said, wow. I mean, I, I, I don't think God shows anybody something that he doesn't show anybody else. If somebody comes to you and says, I heard something from God nobody else ever heard before. Just say false prophet and walk away. <laughs> because let every word be established by two or three witnesses. There's going to be others that see the same thing. And so praise God, I realized this was where Moses struck that rock. And he said, I'm going to put you in a cliff of the rock and I'll cover you with my hand while I pass by and I'll take away my hand and you'll see my back parts. You'll see the afterglow, but my face shall not be seen. And so God's got a message for us. If you want to get so close to God and see His glory, you've got to go to the place where the rock was struck. And from that perspective, the perspective of the cleft, you'll see glory that no one can see unless they stand there too. Let me explain that. In 1 Corinthians 10 and 4, when it talks about Moses striking the rock and feeding them water, and it says... The Israel during the Exodus did all drink the same spiritual drink for they drank of that spiritual rock that followed them and that rock was Christ. Somebody say the rock was Christ. The rock represents Jesus. He's the rock. He's the rock of my salvation. Hallelujah. And it says in Isaiah 53, the great atonement chapter, surely he hath borne our griefs. He carried our sorrows, yet we did esteem him stricken. He was struck for your sins. He was struck because of the sin that you committed. Not the sin that he committed himself. He was sinless. But he took your death. He took your suffering. He took your striking. And when it says he's the rock, and it says that rock was smitten, bless God, standing in that place of the cleft represents standing in the death of Jesus Christ. Standing in the place where he died as you and you're fully aware of it. Standing there that he took your sins and you are now close to God as close as you can get. That no other place will bring you that close as the place when you have all faith and all confidence that his death was my death. I stand from the perspective of the cleft when I believe God sent Jesus to die as me. And I will see glory nobody will have ever seen unless they're staring there too. I'll see glory. I'll see wonders. I'll see amazing. I'll see things in God you can't see. Without Christ and the death of the cross, you'll never see the glory you could otherwise see. How many saw the glory that I'm talking about this morning? How many saw him from the death of Jesus Christ? Do you believe here that his death counted as yours? Do you believe that his burial is your burial? His resurrection is your resurrection. His ascension and seating in heavenly places means you're seated together with him in heavenly places. And him being above all principalities and powers means that you're above all principalities and powers in him. Amen. Woo, come on, let's clap unto the Lord right now. Hallelujah. Amen. 
You'll see glory when you stand from that perspective. Can you imagine getting into a battle against the devil and standing in it from the perspective of the cleft? You're not going to see defeat. You're going to see victory. Hallelujah. You're going to see such glorious victory, such overcoming glory. Praise God that the enemy doesn't have a chance because you're facing him from the perspective of my death with Jesus Christ. Because Satan, all he could do is kill. All he could do is bring death. But resurrection is life from the dead. What else can Satan do when you've resurrected with Jesus Christ? Try facing the devil like that and see how the end comes out. Woo! Oh, let's clap again under him. Pray. He is that rock. You'll never see glory like you'll see it when you stand from the perspective of the cross. Moses could stand in the rock at the place where it was struck. And you know, God said, I will put you. Did you happen to notice the terms? Don't miss a word in the Bible because every word is important. I will put you in that cleft. It says, I will do it. God puts us in Christ. God puts us into the death of Jesus. Hallelujah. And when he puts you in that death, look, that's greater than cancer being healed. That's greater than eyes being opened that are blinded and deaf ears unstopped. The greatest miracle there is when God saves you through the death of Jesus Christ. Hallelujah. Because when you go into his death, you say, goodbye, Adam. I'm out of your race. I get born into your race and I'm getting out of it right now by God putting me in the death of Jesus and I died to all of this. And now when I resurrect, because Jesus resurrected three days after he was buried, I resurrect with him after being put inside of him at the point of his death, and I'm in a new creation, and I got a new Adam. Hallelujah. Jesus is the last man Adam. 1 Corinthians 15 and 45 says, we didn't get a, an Adam from the dust of the ground. We got the Lord from heaven himself. Hallelujah. A quickening spirit, praise God. How many are glad for the quickening power of the Holy Ghost? Thank you, Jesus. And so when you believe that God puts you into the death of Jesus, God sees your faith. This is what it takes God to do it. He needs to see your faith. Jesus died my death. Does anybody remember the tomb they buried Jesus in? Whose tomb was it? Arimathea. Joseph of Arimathea. Every one of us need to put Jesus in our tombs, so to speak. How many know what I mean when I say that? Every one of us spiritually need to say, the death I deserve, he took it for me. The grave I was supposed to be going into because of my sin, he did it. And when Joseph put Jesus in his own brand new tomb that hadn't been used yet, praise God, that's a picture of every one of us. We take that death of Jesus and apply it to our death. Apply it to when we're supposed to die and be buried. That's Taken care of now because Jesus Christ died in my place. Hallelujah. Yes, my body's still going to give in one day. And until if the Lord doesn't come, the trumpet doesn't sound before this heart stops ticking, I'll be buried. But that's not the death that judges sin. Jesus' death on the cross already took my sin. Amen. How many are glad Jesus took your sin already? Hallelujah. And you're not going to die because of sin when you do die. And so... God needs to see that faith in you. And when you believe Jesus died in your place and God is letting us and we thank God so much for... God, thank you for the miracle that you allowed us to take the death of Jesus and say that's our death. That's our death sentence. So we don't have to experience that separation from you anymore. But when Jesus said, my God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? He took the forsakenness that you should have experienced. That we did experience ever since we were born. He took it. And then he became forsaken so we would be accepted. Hallelujah. He became sin for us so we could become the righteousness of God. And when you believe that, God puts you in the death of Jesus. Just like God said, I'll put you in the cleft of the rock that's right close to me. Oh, I'm in a place that's close to Jesus. You're in a place that's close to God. Amen. And, and that's what baptism's all about. It, it pictures that. We're baptized into his death. And so Moses standing in the place of the cleft is like you and I getting into the death of Jesus. And that's where we'll see glory. 
Now, Exodus 34 and 5. And the Lord descended in the cloud, stood with him there. Oh, that beautiful four-letter word, with. He's with me. His cloud's here. I want to know him. I don't want to know an angel. I don't want to know anybody. I want to know him. And now I've asked to see his glory. He's put me in this place of the cleft, the place I struck. How many know it was because of us that he was struck? It's because of us that he took those nails and he took that beating. It's like we struck him. But bless God, it was our sins and God had it to be so. If it wasn't for our sins, he never would have been struck. I remember hearing an old song in the 80s, country southern gospel song, and southern country gospel, not my favorite music, but I remember that chorus. It said, who put the tears in the eyes of the lamb? We did. All of us did. In other words, because of our sin, Jesus had to suffer. Aren't you glad he loved us that much that he did it? And he said, now the Lord's descended in the clouds. He's standing there with me. And he proclaimed the name of the Lord. And the Lord passed by before him and proclaimed the Lord. The Lord God. This is what God's saying. Merciful and gracious. Long-suffering and abundant in goodness and truth. Imagine Moses hearing that. He must have just been quaking with tears pouring down his eyes like waterfalls. Keeping mercy for thousands. Forgiving iniquity and transgression and sins. How many know in Jesus Christ that one single place, that one single death, six hours on a cross one Friday, that one place, that cleft of the rock is where he forgave thousands. Hallelujah. Let's change that to millions. Multiplied hundreds of millions. Billions, praise God. He said, if I be lifted up, I will draw all men unto me and I will die their deaths. And the next verse says, this spake he concerning his death. Aren't you glad they lifted him up on that cross and he drew us all into him and he died our deaths. And if you're getting what I'm saying, you're starting to see more glory even than what you have seen. Hallelujah. You see, we really got to understand and believe it like that. And he keeps going on. And Moses, verse 8, made haste, bowed his head toward the earth and worshipped. Notice it was emphasizing mercy at that place of the rock cleft. Forgiveness. At that place where Jesus was struck, where the rock of our salvation was struck, where an opening happened, and we were put into that death, that's where mercy, that's where forgiveness is found. Praise God. That kind of glory won't be seen anywhere else. You won't see the forgiveness of God apart from the cross. You won't see mercy for thousands upon thousands, aside from the death, the burial, the resurrection, aside from the blood of Jesus. How many know nothing? Everybody say nothing, nothing but the blood. Nothing but the blood. Nothing. What can wash away my sins? What can forgive thousands? What can bring iniquity down? Nothing but the blood of Jesus. And that glory of his forgiveness, you'll never see anywhere else than from the perspective of the cleft. Hallelujah, God. Jesus died and you need to believe that, but not just when you get saved. How I many know well, that's why we got saved? We believe that. Believe it every other struggle you go through from that point on. Face every struggle from the perspective of the cleft. Satan attacks you. Okay, I got to get my heart situated right here. Otherwise, I'll be fearful. I'll be frantic. I'll scream. I'll holler. I'll complain at life. I might even get mad at God and, and blow my lid. I got to get my mind straight here. Okay, I died with Jesus. I was buried with him. I was resurrected from him. And the more you think that, the more your face starts rising up. And the Father in heaven is smiling broadly. Hallelujah. And you're realizing, oh, wait, wait a minute. If I died with Jesus, Satan, what can you do to me? You're trying to attack me here. You're trying to throw sickness. You're trying to throw financial problems, family, all of these issues. But I overcame you through the death of Jesus with the greatest power you ever had. So you think your financial powers are going to 
mess me up? Not on my life. You think all of the financial, the family, the sickness is going to deter me? Not at all. If I could conquer death, your former power, that my father now has the keys over. Hallelujah. Then bless God, I'm going to overcome this situation right now. And you'll see glory come down again. And God will move on your behalf. And he'll send that devil off to Pluto. Hallelujah. And you'll have victory. Amen. Victory, victory. Somebody say victory. Let's clap unto the Lord together. Thank you, Jesus. Hallelujah, God. Believe he died that it counts as your death. Believe you're in the place of the cleft that's closer to God than anywhere else. And you'll see glory you just won't see anywhere else. You see, in Philippians 3 and 7, Paul is writing and said some words almost identical to Moses. But what things were gained to me, those I counted loss for Christ. How many know when God's really going to be your God, you can't be your own God? Paul was talking about all the heredity, all of the pedigree he had as a Hebrew. He said, Hebrews, they drooled at the mouth to have what I've got. I'm of the strictest sect of the Pharisees. I'm a Hebrew of Hebrews. My parents brought me into this thing. I didn't join as a proselyte. I was born into it. I even know what tribe I'm in. And there's ten lost tribes now. He said, but mine's not lost. I know I'm from the tribe of Benjamin. And, and, and he said, but all those things that were gained to my flesh under the law, he said, I let them go. I let them go. And I'm sure my teachers, Gamaliel was one of the greatest Judaic teachers in his day. And then Paul said, I'm sure my teachers disappointed in me. Maybe I'm ashamed of him now. And he's ashamed of me. But he said, it's not about me. It's about him. So anything that lifts me up, I'm losing it. Why? For Christ. Christ is more than anything to me. Folks, people will say, if you don't let go of Jesus... You're letting go of our friendship. Bye. You say, look, you're going to have to go then. Because I'll never let go of Jesus. And you might lose friends over it. But who cares? God is with you. And he'll give you better friends than you ever had before anyhow. Hallelujah. Count those things as loss if they're gained to you. If it lifts you up. If it exalts you. If it makes you feel better in your flesh and your carnality. Let that go. Because it's robbing God of glory when you give yourself glory. We've got to stop talking about us doing this and us doing that. Even if it's for God, we need to say God did this that day. We need to see God did that. Remember what I preached the other day when John came into the presence of Jesus in Revelation 1? He fell like a dead man. When Isaiah saw God in Isaiah 6 high and lifted up, he said, man, I'm a man of unclean lips. I'm unworthy. People that get so close to God have lost all that self, have lost all that pride. Me, me, me. I, I, I. They lost it all. Because their heart is everything sold on Jesus. I've seen too many Christians sold on themselves. Folks, we got to let that go. Because we could actually use God to exalt ourselves. Like God tested Moses with. Oh boy, the Spirit's telling me right now. That's why God put him through that test. Before he showed him his glory. Listen, God's speaking. God was going to see if it, Moses had much of self in him anymore. And when Moses turned down the opportunity to be the new Abraham, God says, I can show a guy like that my glory. That one, he's too full of himself. She is too full of herself. All they talk about is themselves. But this guy, he's concerned more about me than he is of himself. He's concerned about those stiff-necked, wicked people that even he got angry at more than himself. Oh man, I feel the Holy Ghost here right now. You'll tell somebody's been close to God when they're emptied of themselves. But how many ever know what it's like when somebody walks in the room and the whole show's about them? Here I am. Welcome me. Bow down and clap. I'm here. They might be there, but God's a million miles away. But when we let go and let Him have all the glory. And so Paul said... I counted those things as loss. Yea, doubtless. I'm convinced of this. I count all things but loss. What for? What are you trading? What are you letting that go for? For the excellency of the knowledge of Jesus, my Lord. Somebody say, I want to know Jesus. 
for whom I have suffered the loss of all things. In fact, I count them but dung. Uh, that's just manure in my mind now compared to winning Christ and be found in Him. I want to be in that cleft. I want to be in Christ. I don't want to have my own righteousness, which is of the law, which is by me doing all these good deeds, getting everybody to say how good I am. But I want that which is through the faith of Christ, the righteousness which is of God. Somebody say, not works, by God. Which is of God by faith. And here's what Moses said 4,000 years earlier, or 2,000 years earlier, that I may know Him. Isn't that what Moses said? God, that I may know you. I don't want to know this angel. That I may know you. And the power of his resurrection. The fellowship of his suffering. Being made conformable unto his death. If by any means I might attain to the resurrection of the dead. Oh, hallelujah. Look at it. Exodus 33 and 13. That I may know thee, Moses said. Philippians 3 and 10. Paul said that I may know him. Somebody say it's the cross. They were both talking about the forgiveness, but Paul knew the cross when it was still a mystery in Moses' day. But you remember Moses saw the face of the Lord one day? You can't see my face, Moses, so I have to cover you. But what did Jesus and Moses and Elisha do on the Mount of Transfiguration that day? Jesus' face was unveiled, shining like the sun, and Moses finally saw him face to face. Whew. I mean, oh, Jesus brought what the shadow just prepared their, them for under law. And now we've got the full-blown glory. Now you're going to see me, Moses. Oh, man, there's a sermon there, Ray. Eh? Oh, <laughs> there's a sermon there. Praise God. And so... Somebody say, one man's death. One man's death. What else can the devil do to us when we get in the perspective of the cleft and face him? Oh, you're facing me, devil. Just a second. Hold on. I'm dead with Christ. I'm buried with him. My victory is from Christ's victory. His power's on me. The same power that raised him from the dead's on me. The same power that said, Grave, where's your victory? Satan, you lost. That's on me right now. Okay, devil, what did you come for? He'll probably run with his tail between his legs without even bothering what he said. What he wanted to say. Whew, I'm here thankful for Jesus Christ. Hallelujah, God. And he says, And it shall come to pass while my glory passes by. I'll put you. There's where God said, I'll put you. You can't put yourself there. God's got to do it. And you have faith in him. And then he starts positioning you just right. I'll put you and bless God, I'll cover you. Aren't you glad he covered us? He covered us and protected us by the blood of Jesus Christ. Oh, let's all stand today and thank God together for...